right? One feeling well tonight, that's right. And uh, he's also uh, got six kids, that's right? Ooh. Yes, sir. <laughs> three boys, three girls. This is a dad joke, so bear with me. <laughs> we have six kids, and I spiritualized it. God created the world in six, six days. days. We had six kids while we're resting. <laughs> so, I thought it was funny when you first came to my church, and uh, we're a small church. You're a small church, you'll understand this. And I told them, we had just had a little baby. Our sixth one was born about here. And I said, hey, I did my part in growing the church. You're next. And now that you know, the two families in the church both uh, expected at about the same time. I was like, wow, these people really listen. <laughs> so, anyway, I have a lot of energy. I think maybe that's a little bit of kindred spirit there. I noticed uh, brother, your pastor here, he came in. He's got some energy. Yeah. He can put some of us, um, he can give us some of us a little competition of his energy. <laughs> And uh, anyway, I appreciate that. I get very enthusiastic. I, I'm one, when I enjoy something, man, I just jump all the way in and I enjoy it. And uh, I was thinking about missions conference. You're thinking about it. You, you know the missions messages. You've got John chapter 4. You've got all these missions messages. And I knew Jackie Powell was going to do a presentation tonight. I thought, I'm going to take something from the Psalms, a Jewish scripture. But I want us to see there's a parallel. You know why? I am one who is very much for God not being through with Israel. Because if God gave up on Israel, what's to say he won't give up on you and I? Amen. All right, all right. And he's not God if that's the case. Now, God is a God who when he speaks and he gives a promise, you take it to the bank, it's guaranteed. Amen. It doesn't happen in our timetable, but it'll happen in his timetable. Right. And uh, anyway... Don't want to get too excited on that. I will say a few things. I do have some odds and ends back in the back there. Um, just paraphernalia of my childhood, my wife. There's some French things. So the um, civilized things, that's my wife. The country things, that's me. Um, I grew up in Mali, West Africa until I was about 12 or 13 years. That was my way of life. I knew no, nothing different. We lived in a mud brick home. And no power, electricity. We did things the old Amish way. And uh, didn't even know it. It was just, like I said, a way of life. But I will tell you this. And regardless of culture, language, color, whatever, God is the same God. All right. And he uses us all the same. Good. And I've learned that over the course of my life. And I have learned to trust the fact that God created us in his image. And because of that, he loves us with an everlasting love and he does great things. So missions. I'm not going to spell it out, all the practical how to do missions. I believe your pastor does a pretty good job of that. I'm not here to overstep him. I respect him and I respect his ministry. But I am here to kind of give a behind the scenes or get into the heart of missions. Why? So we're going to look at Psalm 96. This is my all-time favorite psalm when I think of missions and I think of the, the message of the gospel. Some people say, well, why Psalm 96? That was before they even knew who Jesus was. But there is a writer of this psalm who's introduced to us. This psalm is introduced to us. I'll keep one finger in Psalm 196. And if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and 16, you'll see the inspiration for the writing of this psalm. Inspiration is King David. All right. And in chapter 15, I'm going to try to keep moving here. David finally successfully brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. That was a tragedy. Horrible mistakes were done by the Jewish people, and as a result, the Ark of the Covenant was taken off. But you have to remember something. At this moment in time in history, if they were to follow the instruction of God on how to worship God, they needed the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented for them the presence of God. And David is one that we know in scriptures love God. So David here, chapter 15, he brings the ark to Jerusalem. And you know why David's excited? Because now the tabernacle is complete. It has the ark of the covenant. Now they can worship God in spirit and in truth. And as they were instructed to do so by the law of Moses. Now we know on this side of the cross that God, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those scriptures. Yeah. And now... As Jesus told the woman at the well, because of what I am going to do, you don't need to go on the mountain or at the temple. You can worship me anywhere. You can worship me in spirit and in truth. That is a blessing. You know what's a beautiful imagery of that as well? 
Jesus, he brings his disciples in the upper room to observe what Jewish holiday? Passover. Passover. Think about the preparation for the Passover. A Jewish person wanting to honor his God, and he reads the law of Moses, he's got to go through all these steps. That was a couple-day process to get everything ready. But Jesus presents the Passover and proclaims himself the Passover lamb, and what does he give? The Lord's Supper. What is involved in the Lord's Supper? Two things. He takes something that was complicated, and he simplifies it, and he makes a covenant, a promise to the church. There's a beautiful book you can get at IBGM Museum that explains, I believe, end-time eschatology beautifully, and Jesus uses the illustration of the Jewish way. You know why Jesus doesn't know the hour of his return? It's not because Jesus is ignorant. All right. It is because Jesus has submitted himself to the will of the Father as an example for us, and when the Father says, hey, son, go get her, Jesus is going to come and get his bride to church. Amen. All that is exciting. And what we need to understand, and what the world needs to understand, is we're not just another religion. The world's got plenty of religion. You know what I find fascinating with David is, he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, and some Jewish people might say, oh, well, David's a religious man, and he wants the Ark of the Covenant. You know why David was excited? Because to him, God is real. Yes. And David really wanted to worship his yes. God. Yes. So he got the Ark of the Covenant back, and now David's heart is filled with joy and hope right. because his people can worship God as God intended. Because why? David knows, ultimately, it's not the Ark of the Covenant. It's not the tabernacle. It's not the keeping of the law. It is the fact that God is real, and Amen. David had a relationship with him, and you see that. Read the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to share with you Amen. something that I think will help you in the area of missions. Missions is not a program. Hallelujah. I know that we have programs because we're humans. We like to organize things. And Vision Baptist Mission, you're, you're, they have a very, they're a good organization. But I know this about Vision Baptist Missions. Most of the ones I've met, it's a way of life. Missions is trained to be a way of life. How do I get that to be a way of life? Oh, I know what I need to do. I need to educate myself in cross-cultural communications. <laughs> that's a tool that's helpful. But let me tell you where you start. Our right. foundation is Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Psalm 96, without any further ado, I'll start off. If you don't mind marking in your Bible, that's your choice. But if you don't mind, I will show you. The outline is all the passage. I have one little paper just to help my train of thought. But everything is in this passage, and it's all outlined beautifully for us. This is a song. I wish I knew the tune, because then we could sing it. <laughs> but he starts off Psalm 96. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for thank this God. message, and thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with a joy and a passion as this psalmist has, and that you would put a new song in our heart, and that we might take this song, and we might let it sink into our very soul, and Lord, use it in a very special way as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I read verse 1 as the introduction, because that is the introduction. Now, what I find interesting about David's Psalm 96 here is he starts off with the invitation. What do I mean by that? He says, oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. But look at that. That's a command. He is telling the audience, sing unto the Lord a new song. Right. He gave the invitation before he even preached the message or shared the message of the song. And that is the instruction for us as believers, is sing unto the Lord a new song. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? Does that mean I just sing everywhere I go? Well, you can. No one's going to stop you. Well, maybe they'll try. But no, sing unto the Lord. The key here is a new song. If you look in the original language of the word new, it can mean new, but it actually has a greater meaning of fresh. Let me illustrate. How many of you here know the hymn, How Great Thou Art? I think many of us are Amazing Grace. Many of us probably don't even need a hymnal for that, right? That's an old song. In fact, it literally is an old song because it was written well before my time. How many of you have ever sung that song as a new song? Let me tell you uh, a moment for me where it felt like a new song. I chose Bible College. I let you not for any spiritual reason. I'm just being honest. I am not a city person. When you grew up in the middle of the Sahara Desert and you hardly have any cars, Atlanta is terrifying. And that's where our home church was. We came back in the furrow of like, oh, what in the world? Can't play soccer in the streets. Um, 
Side note, rabbit trail. You said College Park? Yes, sir. I went a little bit in high school in, in Georgia, and I tried, tried as a keyword to play basketball, and College Park educated my school <laughs> more than I would like to educate <laughs> basketball. Um, but we still love, we still love College Park. But yes, I'm very familiar with College Park in that area. And uh, yeah, you guys taught us a lot on basketball. You, you, you motivate us. I think we won three games the whole season. And uh, yeah, anyway, back to on track. New song. So I went up to northern Wisconsin, middle of nowhere, Bible College, and I did it because of the trees and the woods and the forest. Because what I saw there is the man, when college stressed me out, when life stressed me out, you know what I like to do? Get out in the woods, away from people. I don't understand squirrel language, so they can say and do whatever they want. But here's where How Great Thou Art comes in. How Great Thou Art in the song I've grown up with, I know that song. I can sing it in church and write a grocery list. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm just saying it's an old song, I know it. But you know, there are moments in life when God does something miraculous or, or providential in your life, and you're considering His greatness, and suddenly when you sing that song, it's fresh. It's alive. It's like the greatest song you've ever heard in your life. And I remember singing by a campfire, looking at a lake and the beauty of God's creation, thinking, as I saw the stars unblocked by city lights, God, you are a great God. Amen. And I think sometimes we get so lost in the hustle and bustle of life that like Peter, who did a miraculous thing by walking in the water, we get our eyes on the waves and the, the tumult of life, and we forget what a great God we have. So David here is rejoicing in his great God, and he invites the audience, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. That's the first point. He is calling the earth to sing a new song. The first stanza is an invitation, join me in singing a song. Now someone, a Jewish person, might ask this. Well, what makes my God so great? Why would I sing unto the Lord a good song? Well, David, if he were here, he would say, Hey, I'm glad you asked. Keep on reading. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, lowercase plural. For all the gods of the nations are what? Idols, humps of wood, pieces of metal. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his century. Here's my challenge to you. God has called you to a sing a new song. In other words, don't keep this knowledge and love and glory of God to yourself. It is something to be proclaimed. And then if someone says, well, why? Why should I proclaim it? He gives the answer. It starts off with, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. That is the underlying truth. When you read scripture, do I, I really do not need any other explanation except I know that God is great. He is omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. He is the creator of the world. He is the savior of souls. He is the great I am, and he will rule forever. And so he's great. And great way to be praised. But he goes on from there. And he says, he is to be feared above all the gods. Now he goes into it personally. You know, we think of idols when we read that. We think little carved statues. And I believe he was referring to that. But you know what? We make all kinds of idols. Good. We have every imaginable idol under the sun. Now again, I grew up in Africa. And one thing that in our area that was happened is twofold, I'll say this. What you'll find in third world countries or cr countries like Africa where they predominantly live agriculturally, you don't have a hard time telling them there's a God. They don't know the God, but you know what they understand? There are things so far beyond my control that I sure hope there's a higher being out there. No. The problem is because they don't know that God, they look at creation and they end up worshiping the creation rather than the creator. That's it. And I don't necessarily fault them for it because their eyes have been opened to God. And that's the beauty of missions. They say, hey, you, you're, you're, you're looking. That's good. But let me tell you who made the tree. Amen. Let me tell you. Because here's the thing. I remember in Africa they would have little wooden idols. They had idols to everything. Because, hey, let's appease as many gods as humanly possible. Surely one of them will help me out. But here's the thing, you'll see a beautifully carved idol. So you ask the gentleman, who made that? I did. You have amazing carving skills. That thing's beautiful. And it's set in a beautiful, gorgeous setting. Their house might be a mess, but that idol is the neatest spot in the whole place. Why? 
because they hope that that idol will meet their needs. Today, we have people in our country and in our neighborhoods who hope and think their job is the answer to all their problems. If I just had more money. And you know how they worship their God? They work. They sell. They steal. They do whatever it takes to get that money because that money is the answer to all of life's problems. As crazy as it sounds, you guys are close enough to the country. You can relate with this. I know uh, you, if you lived in Georgia long enough, you've experienced rednecks. You live in Kentucky. I know you have. Um, I work with a guy. His whole world revolved around his truck. Anything happened to his truck, his world was over. He didn't realize it, but he had an idolatry problem. Everything was revolved around his truck, and everybody on the outside was like, Man, dude, you're crazy. We all have idols. If it's not God, it's an idol. And you know who makes idols? We do. Here's the beautiful thing about my God. I didn't make my God. My God made me. Amen. And that is a beautiful thing. That is a message that we have. What does he say? He says, declare, tell, tell his glory. Why should you tell his glory? Because there's a bunch of people who are leaning on money, on fame, on power, on how many YouTube hits they have, or this or that, or everything else, and none of that's going to help them. All of that will leave them empty. But my God made me. My God made them. My God truly knows their needs and my God can truly help them. Right. And when that sinks down into the pit of your soul and you truly understand that my God is the answer to COVID, my God is the yes. answer to politics, my yes. God is the answer to the problem in Israel, yes. my God is the answer to everything. Amen. Right. Why are we declaring them? And I would venture to say that it's because we've gotten distracted by the things of this world and we have lost a little bit of our passion for Him. I don't need to have a lot of knowledge. You know what I need to know? I need to know my God. And as I know my God and see who He is, man, that's exciting. I want to tell people about my God. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor Max, you need proof of that? Go to Psalm 103. Light is a father, pity of his children, so the Lord pity of them that fear Him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. How would he know that? He made us. And I love that as a father. So I think you were asking a question or commenting before. What people don't understand about God is yes, he's the omnipotent creator of the heavens and the earth. And yes, he gave mankind a choice. But when I accepted Christ my Savior, that was an adoption process. You can't adopt a dead person. So adoption isn't salvation. But adoption is what Jesus did to say, hey, I'm going to view you as an adult son and let you have your inheritance. So salvation occurs, new birth, we are born again, and God in heaven at that moment says, not only am I going to see, salvation is not just a get out of jail card. It's not just a get out of hell card. Salvation is the entry point to being available for adoption, and a God in heaven, the creator of the world, adopted you and I. It is. Yes. Regardless of our faults, our backgrounds, our baggage, he doesn't care. He loves you. And he adopted you. When you place your faith and trust in him, he adopted you. So like as a father who pitieth his children, when God looks down on his child, he knows your strengths and weaknesses better than you do. When you're afraid of sharing the gospel, he understands. He's like, hey, just ask for some help. I like our brother's message there. You take it to Jesus. Why? Because he's the son. And the son's got the ear of the father. Amen. And so, I'll try to keep up because I get really excited about this message. But I could go on all night and that would not benefit any of us. We are humans and we do need rest. First point. Declare his glory among the heathen. The word heathen there is the word nations. Right. Set it in context. All the nations but Israel worshipped idols. Israel was the only nation that contained people who worshipped the one true God. Okay, that's just being correct, the historical context of this verse. So he says, The Lord is great, greatly to be praised. He is to be feared by all gods. So I am to declare my God because he is the answer. And this is written in the Old Testament. But see, Israel was supposed to live their life so that others would come and see their great God. Missions is not a New Testament thing. It's the, from the beginning. Right, right. Amen. And so then he says, oh boy, we have missionaries here. This next point, I hope it doesn't step on too many toes. But you know, when a missionary or anybody's been in missions, the first word, give. 
Oh, no. Here's where the guy's going to pressure us and get into our pocketbooks. Oh, no. Listen. He says, give unto the Lord. This is the second part stanza, the second verse of the song. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord, what? Glory, glory and strength. strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Brother I preached a good message on that earlier. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Fear before him all the earth. First stanza went to verse 3, and he answered a question of why we declare in verses 4 through 6. In 7 through 9, he is calling the listeners to worship. I know he uses the word give, but I know it's worship because he says glory and strength. In other words, everything in my being is what Paul wrote in the New Testament. Do all to the glory. How many of you quoted that verse in Corinthians before you ate a meal at camp? Whether therefore you eat, or drink, or do all to the glory of God. That verse is a mission verse. It is not a before the meal verse. That is a missionary verse. And if you read two verses later, Paul tells you why. So that people might know him. That's why you do it all to the glory of God. Because you're trying to point people to your heavenly father. That mission is an awesome missionary verse. And we, I think sometimes we, uh, we uh, um, do our children a disservice by only quoting it before a meal. And the kid grows up not realizing that's an amazing missionary verse. Give unto the Lord, in other words, worship him. Why? Verse 10 is the answer. Say among the heathen. Again, here's a missional statement. Declare, go ye into all the world at what? Reach. Reach the gospel. That's New Testament. Same concept, same principle. Say among the nations that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Why do we worship our God? Because he is the highest position of authority there can possibly ever be. Wow. He is holy, righteous, and just. Amen. And because of his position, every one of us will stand before him right. as judge. Well, that's a motivation for me. I'm motivated to share Jesus because I know he's the answer. Amen. I'm motivated to share Jesus because I know everybody I meet and look at, including this guy, is going to have to stand before him. Amen. And I'd much rather than stand before him as a child of yes. God right. than a lost person. Amen. So that is the second one, is a call to worship. I love verse 9. It says, I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the French Bible, it says, with sacred instruments, is how it's translated. And it's apt, it's appropriate. The idea of is, I don't worship God for me. That's good. I worship God for Him. You know, there are a lot of churches in our country who have tarnished the gospel. Why? Because their wealth of man is too big. Mm -hmm. What is the church for? The church is the believer. It is believers. Do we invite the lost? Well, yes. When you have a family reunion, if you ever have a family reunion and you invite outsiders in, hey, we're having a family reunion, but hey, we love you. You know what church is? I hope you view church this way. Oh, yeah. You know what church is? Church is a family sit-down meal. It is your Heavenly Father in Heaven who says, you know what, I love when my family gets together. I want to feed you. I'm your Heavenly Father. I want to prepare for you. The family is a picture of the Godhead. God the Father, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit does the work. You think the mom does? That's the word of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Your new birth, Holy Spirit. The mom, okay, Holy Spirit. In the family, the family pictures the Godhead. God the Father, he's the provider. Holy Spirit, as the mother, nourishes, comforts, illuminates. Hey, when I don't understand dad's instructions, you know what the Holy Spirit does? Illuminates my understanding. And when I'm not doing what dad says, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts me and says, Hey, you're, you better mind it. But why does a mom do that? You've got some moms in here, I'm sure. Your children may think your exist to make their life miserable. <laughs> but you know why you exist. You exist to make sure that kid lives long enough right. to do something great. Right. Right. You care for them. Next time you get convicted by the Holy Spirit, you should say thank you. Yes. Because that's the Holy Spirit crying out, Hey, watch out! You're getting yourself into trouble. Amen. And then what's the Son? Jesus Christ. The true Son. The perfect Son. Hey, if I'm an adopted child of God, you know what I want to be like? I want to be part of the family. Yeah. Man, what's the family like? Okay, God the Father, the Holy Spirit. I'm an adopted son. That makes Jesus what to us? A brother. A brother. That's crazy. How is that even possible? Because God the Father made it possible. So we worship him, and we recognize that third point. A lot is, um, 
It's a call to nature. I don't, this is an interesting stanza, but it says, because it calls out trees and rocks and, and, and creation to rejoice. But I believe this is a future song. This is a messianic song. This is the psalm. Psalm is the same. We got the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. But there will come a day, because David didn't understand all the details, but he knew this. There would come a day when the Messiah would come and rule and reign and fulfill all the promises. And in that, he looked in that day, he looked for the righteous judge to come back and to rule and reign. And he cries out for creation. Why? Because right now creation is groaning. Literally. I think as we get close to the last days, the scriptures tells us that all of creation is groaning. It is, literally. Well, look at the world. It doesn't take much to see. We have pestilence, disease, earthquake, fire. I mean, the earth is groaning. And I'll be honest, I'm not saying I'm going to, don't, I'm not a tree hugger. But God did call us to be stewards of this planet. Right? And we are doing a horrible job. You know? And the earth is groaning for his return. That's right. You know what I see is I see people groaning for his return and they don't know it. Yeah. What are people crying out for? Equality, mm -hmm. justice, mm -hmm. peace. That's what the world's crying out. And they don't even recognize it and they don't even realize it, but they're part of that groaning saying, we need help. But unfortunately, they often go to the wrong source. Yeah. You know who else is groaning? It's the church. It is getting harder and harder to preach and share and live out our faith. And it's going to keep getting harder as the day approaches. So you keep flying on, but here's the beautiful thing the psalmist understands that Jesus is the answer. And when he comes back, so this is a future thing. He is calling the future, but it's relational. And let's see. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful. Sorry. I did two things at once. Bad mistake. I'm a guy. I can only do one thing at a time. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood be what? Rejoice. In that day, the trees of the field, everything will rejoice. Before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. I'm going to reread this last verse and pose a question. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. For he shall judge the world with righteousness and people with his truth. Be honest with me. When you hear someone saying, the judge is coming, do you typically shout and say, hallelujah? <laughs> do you think the criminal who gets called, who gets a court, a summons to court, goes, hallelujah, man, I can hardly wait to stand before him. the judge. This is going to be fantastic. This is going to be great. See, that's illogical to me. And I read this passage and I'm like, wait a minute, I've got to reread these verses. Something doesn't match up. Yeah. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful. If you read that in the end, I have a lot of energy. But even I don't have the energy in the Hebrew language because this is a building excitement. It is a progressive excitement. But what is he excited for? He's excited for the coming of the judge. And that goes against every human fiber. Why would you be excited about that? Because judges typically bring condemnation. And then, duh, the lights turn on. If you're a child of God, you are now, therefore, not under condemnation. Therefore, now there's no condemnation. Absolutely. So then I recognize this psalm really is a blessing to the saved. Right. It is not a blessing to the lost. That's right. The lost has every cause to fear the coming of the Lord. But you as a believer, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is now therefore no condemnation. So when I think of the judge, suddenly I realize, I'm not standing in the guilty seat. <laughs> Jesus did that for me. That's All right. right. Amen. And it makes, you know, depending what seat you're sitting in, it makes a world of difference. Yes. You know, when I see the injustice in the world around me, and when I see what's going on, and I see the hatred, and I see the spite, and I see the wickedness, I'm groaning for his return. Somebody needs to set things right. We need peace in this world. And until there's peace in Jerusalem, there's not going to be peace in this world. And then I bring it back to this thought. I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. And as I go through my life, I wonder, how real is God to me? Is there a new soul in my heart? Or, you know, I'm just starting to go through the motions of Christianity, and, and God's kind of in the afterburner, and I forget my Heavenly Father, and I, God's here with us. You realize that. How many of you 
think it's great when you ignore someone in the room. You know they're there, but you kind of just ignore them. That's not great, right? It's not considered quiet. Jesus says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. He is with us always. And I sometimes wonder in life if the simple answer to missions is remembering Jesus is in the room. Amen. And then point people to it. Tell them about it. See, mission starts in the heart. God gave us three angels. You see the time? Okay. Look how much I'm supposed to be done. <laughs> 820, I think I saw a bulletin. All right. All right. Uh, lost my train of thought. God, let me, just, let me just reset the old noggin up here. Got too excited for my own good. We serve a great God. There you go. Yes, we really do. Yeah, right. And I struggle with this reality because I have lived in a Christian home. I have known the Lord. I've heard the gospel since I was a little one on top. And I have learned in life that we complicate things so much. There's a great God in heaven. And if I could just learn that he is real, Hebrews 11, he is real. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. By the way, what is an identification of faith? He said it. Obedience. If I believe that God is my Heavenly Father, then why do I keep His commandments? Because I love Dad. And I want to please Him. And I realize the rules and principles of God's Word, really, it's the guide rails on a, a mountain path. Now, people complain about the guardrail on the mountain path. Oh, I can't see the view. I can't that. All right, take them away and see how much you enjoy the drive. <laughs> They view the Bible as restrictive and as prohibitive and as all that, but what they fail to understand is that as a Heavenly Father who loved us enough to give us guardrails. Right. Along with the choice, He gave us guardrails. And so, why do I obey my Heavenly Father? Because He's my Heavenly Father. That's good. And my Heavenly Father knows how to richly reward His sons. I want to tie in another thought, too, of what you said. We've been going through the book of Esther. And there's a marked difference. You look at Esther, the book of Esther, and you compare some of those things with Joseph. Now, how did God, I mean, with Moses, well, Joseph too. There's a lot of similarity between jo um, Joseph, Daniel, and the book of Esther. And there's a verse in the Bible, we love to quote part of it. God works all things out together for good. First stops there. No, it doesn't. God works all things out together for good to them for what? Oh, Paul, who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, Joseph loved God. How do I know that? He obeyed God. When Potiphar's wife tried to tempt him, he ran. And he didn't say, how can I sin against thee? He said, how can I sin against God? And he was called according to his purpose. And Joseph went from the well to the second in command. Mordecai, by the way, don't stone me or cast me out. But I'm going to tell you, reread the book of Esther. You know what that book should be called? The Life of Mordecai. <laughs> Mordecai is actually mentioned way more in there in Esther. In fact, the very last chapter of Esther is Mordecai. Not out to get women. Esther is an amazing woman of character and integrity and of courage. She was a witness. In fact, in the early Jewish days of Purim, that they celebrate to this very day. You know what they used to do um, before the Gospels, before Jesus came? The day before Purim was called Esther's fast. Why? Because Esther called the people to prayer. You know what the day of, Mor of Purim was called? The other name? It was called Mordecai's Day. How God used Mordecai to save the people. And it's a beautiful perspective. And I'm just telling you all of that to say is, you read the people of the Bible who did something, and it wasn't because they were great, super intelligent. It's because for them, God was real. And so when we think of missions and missions in your church, God's real. You know what? People in our community, they can tell the difference between a formula and a relationship. What do I mean by that? Some of us call it a formula for sharing the gospel. All right, Romans go. Uh, don't interrupt with your questions. I've got to finish my verses and do everything in the right order. You know, the greatest impact that you can have on this neighborhood is a changed life. Amen. Changed life. Where someone looks at you and says, man, you're different. You're different. Your God's real. You know what the greatest testimony in Mali, West Africa was? 98% Islamic. I'm going to tell you this about Islam right now, because I live in the country of it. Islam is not just a religion. Islam is a way of life. Every aspect of their life is affected by their faith. 
How tragic that their faith is misplaced. So when you come up to a Muslim and you share the, the faith, they see a religion, they see the Catholic Church. That's what they see, to be honest. Historically, they tend to put us all in the same category. And you know what gets a Muslim's heart and makes them listen for the first time? When they see that your faith affects your law. Suddenly they start paying attention. Something different about you. It's not just a religion where you might go one Sunday out of the whole year. Man, this affects how you act. This affects your attitude. This affects how you treat people. This affects how you handle your food. We don't do anything weird. I don't think you guys do anything weird in Mumbo Jumbo. But what do we do as believers often? We will pray before we eat. Why? Because we're expressing gratitude for His provision. They observe that. And they say, all right. Something is different about you. But you know what they really point out? If you want to converse with a Muslim person, you can start off with the holiness of God, common ground. They believe that God's holy. You tell them God's just. They believe God's just. In fact, they believe that God is so holy and just that you will never see him, even when you go to heaven. No matter which level of heaven you go to, you will never see God because he is that holy. And I would actually agree with them and say that you are right. God is that holy. I can't see him, not because of me, but because of the Son. The hardest obstacle that any of us will have in sharing the gospel with the Muslims, not that God is holy or just, it is his love and his grace. Because they view love, why do so many Christians treat that God this way? That, oh, God loves me, he overlooks my sins. And that flies in the face of the Muslim verdict. God's that holy and just, why would he, that, he can't be just if he just overlooks your sin. So maybe a believer whose life is changed and you have a genuine hope and you love God because of who he is and you're obeying him that and you're not trying to earn bonus points with God, suddenly they start paying attention to like, man, you got something that I don't have. Every day I can work. A Muslim can do everything right. And you know how, ever seen the bridge track? There's a great gulf fixed between us and God and there's a cross. The Muslims have the same track, by the way. But it's not a cross. It is a spider web. That's a tragedy. The cross is a secure, safe way fixed between me and God the Father. To a Muslim, they can do all the works, but they're still going to be walking on a spider web hoping they don't fall off. They never have hope. So we have hope. And that's what we need to give them. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord who? Just the Jewish people? All the earth. Right. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. I'm not going to do this now, but if you ever want a good passage, a companion passage to read, I'll just read one verse of it. You read the rest in your own time. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. That's not Ephesians, that's Corinthians. We went through 1 Corinthians in that church and we're like, you know, we're tired of dealing with a church with a lot of problems. We <laughs> need some encouragement. Let's go to Ephesians. And, Amen. you know, it's encouraging. Amen. He starts off verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then I'm going to stop there because you can enjoy the rest on your own. Then he just recounts all that our Heavenly Father has done for us. Who we are in Christ. He tells us our identity. And that's why I think there's a similarity between Psalm 96 and the New Testament that the heart of Psalm 96 is someone whose God is real. Amen. A God worth declaring, a God worthy of worship, and a God who is worth looking forward to. Good. And all of those things should call us and compel us to share the gospel in a relational way, not a religious way. Amen. Relational way is going to your neighbor. I don't know if you have a neighbor, you may have a neighbor, you never said anything. Here's a relational way. You go to their house with a plate of cookies or something, knock at the door. They open the door and you say, hey, you know, I have lived next to you all my life. You know, I've never once come over and said hi to you. And I'm really sorry about that. And I brought this plate of cookies and I want to correct that. And after they pick their jaw off the ground or they start apologizing, you know, I've lived next to you and it's true, I've never talked to you. You do that. And then you leave. You know what you've done? Is you've shown your neighbor that you care about them. And as the Lord permits and allows, and you build that relationship with them, you're eventually, I guarantee it, you, you're eventually going to share 
Before I close the prayer, let me ask you, tell you something as a way of application. You know what I find to be true? I work at a factory in Michigan, and in that factory, you're stuck in line with another person eight hours every day, 40 hours a week. You ain't going nowhere, they're not going anywhere. And as I sit there with people, you know what, I can start to tell what they like. That's why I know the guy loved his truck. You know what, he talked about eight hours every day. <laughs> his truck and his diesel engine and this thing that he had and that and the tires until, oh, God, does not listen about your truck? I had another guy, all he talked about was his favorite rock music band. And another person he talked about, what you love is what you talk about. Good. And I have a feeling there's a reason why many Christians don't share Christ. They just don't love them like they ought to. They're too enamored with their house, their job, their whatever. But I wonder, man, if, if maybe that's the way to call to the church is to stop being lukewarm and start loving our job. Good. And we'll find it will be useful again. What you love is what you'll talk about. Lord, we thank you for your word. I realize, Lord, um, there are parts that were clumsily delivered because this speaker is weak and foolish. But at the same time, Lord, I have confidence through the reading of your word and the sharing of your word that your spirit can use that word in each and every life in this room and stir and rekindle and give passion for the lost and more importantly, Lord, passion for you. You truly are a great God. If we stopped and took a paper tonight, Lord, and started writing down all the things you have done for us, we would discover how great you truly are. In Exodus, Lord, we saw how you took the children of Israel and saved them from Egypt, and you used miracles, awe-inspiring miracles, amazing miracles. And, Lord, we rejoice in the miracles, but then, Lord, we go to the book of Esther, and where are the miracles? It was sure lucky that Esther got picked, and Lord, it was sure lucky that Mordecai happened to be at a certain place at a certain time, and, and Lord, it was sure lucky that Ahasuerus listened, and luck had nothing to do with it. It was your providential hand at work, and I think, Lord, there are some of us in this room, maybe all of us, we just don't know it, but because of your divine providence, you have moved a car aside that was going to run into us. You provided a payment for a bill that we didn't even know about. You solve a problem, and sometimes, Lord, we just say we were lucky, but let us not re neglect the reality that <coughs> even those providential things in life, you are a God in heaven who's on the throne, and all of those are a miracle. What the world would call luck came and left the destruction of the Jewish people to a, a roll of the dice. He cast a lot, left it to chance, but Lord, you are the one who controlled the dice. And we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that you would reach down inside of our hearts tonight and renew a passion for you. Help us to see what kind of God we serve. Be excited about that. And Lord, help us share that with others. We have the answer, and that is Jesus. I thank you for all that you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow, I'll... Oh, Pastor wants me to go a different direction.